CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is The World Today. Hello, I'm Juliet Mann. Our top stories this hour. Anthony Blinken says the U.S. will continue to give Ukraine what it needs to fight back against Russia as he makes a surprise visit to Kyiv. From wildfires to floodwaters, at least eight people killed in Europe as rainstorms ravage Greece, Turkey and Bulgaria. While scientists report the Northern Hemisphere's hottest summer on record and African leaders call for new global taxes to fund climate action. Plus, China's Premier Li Chang tells Southeast Asian countries not to take sides in conflicts in order to avoid a new Cold War. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has made a surprise visit to Ukraine, the first by a top U.S. official since Kyiv launched its counteroffensive in June. He met Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba, Prime Minister Denis Shmihal, and is due to meet President Vladimir Zelensky. He's also widely expected to announce a new package of U.S. assistance worth more than a billion dollars. Following Blinken's arrival, Ukraine said a Russian attack on the eastern city of Konstantinivia had killed at least 16 people, with the death toll expected to rise. Well, our correspondent Yolo David is following events. Um, Yolo, what more can you tell us uh, about Blinken's visit? Well, if it is a surprise visit, he will definitely uh, make sure that there is good news in terms of uh, more support for the Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian military. Uh, possibly he will announce uh, up to $200 million in terms of that. And there's an even bigger package expected towards the end of the week. He will come at a time what is fairly crucial. So, of course, he wants to meet Mr. Zelensky. He wants to talk to the foreign minister. But he also most definitely wants to see what is happening with the counteroffensive, as well as, of course, showing support. And what they say is this unwavering commitment to the integrity of Ukraine and the democracy in Ukraine. But most of all, they really want to see what is happening with the counteroffensive and why it's progressing so slowly. We've seen good progress in the counteroffensive, which is very heartening. We want to make sure that Ukraine has what it needs not only to succeed in the counteroffensive, but has what it needs for the long term to make sure that it has a strong deterrent, a strong defense capacity, so that in the future, aggressions like this don't happen again. So it is crucial for this current American administration that Ukraine, of course, succeeds after receiving $43 billion worth uh, of money and weapons to defend its territorial integrity here in Ukraine. But also, there have been behind the scenes unofficial criticisms and concerns how slowly that counteroffensive, especially in the southeast of Ukraine, ha has progressed, even though it's a very long uh, front line. The focus has most definitely been in that area, uh, in the region of Saporizhia, because the Ukrainians are pushing south to try and dislodge the Russians uh, in that land between the Ukrainian forces and the Crimea Peninsula. Uh, because of that, the focus, the media focus, the military focus has been in that region. But of course, there have been uh, big battles happening in other parts of that front line as well. Now, this has irritated the Ukrainians. Uh, the foreign minister only a few weeks ago suggested that any criticisms from Western uh, capitals that people should shut up. And today he was saying that he's looking forward to a productive meeting uh, with Mr. Blinken, but it has to be results oriented. You just get that feeling they're asking, they will ask for more help in terms of the weapons uh, and what they feel has been hampering the counteroffensive. There are other issues as well, not least all these attacks which have happened overnight, happening again today, uh, and that possibly will intensify in Kyiv later this evening. That threat is always there for all the areas in Ukraine, not just on the front line. And there might be some unease and questions mm. asked also about corruption uh, within uh, the uh, army and within the administration in Ukraine. 
Yolo at Dapid, um, thank you very much. Now, as Yolo was talking about there, there's some um, continued um, attacks. Some Ukraine has reported modest gains in its um, counteroffensive, which is now in its fourth month. But Russian troops are said to be well entrenched in their positions. And as Yolo at Dapid reports, training for infantry is being stepped up. It is training, but with intensity. Live bullets and real explosives. Instructors pile on the pressure. They bark orders and shout warnings. One squad of soldiers after another are put through their paces. Our main task is to attack the enemy, and in order to do that, we need to prepare the soldiers as much as we can. These soldiers who are training haven't been in combat yet, but they will. They'll go into battle tomorrow or the day after tomorrow to do what's expected of them. An armoured Swedish troop carrier careers down the track. The troops rush out to clear trenches half filled with water. This rehearsal is to prepare the 57th Brigade for the real battles ahead. It's as realistic an exercise as they're likely to get, preparing them to meet the enemy troops face to face. Men tire as they're given different scenarios. Ten minutes can feel like two hours. Of the hundreds taking part, Dozens of the soldiers are noticeably older. They're taught by professional trainers from various brigades. I deliberately try and confuse the soldiers and mislead them. It's a form of psychological suppression to see how they react to it. And it's a physical pressure too. Instructors like Doc have received some of their training in the West. As Ukraine's infantry prepares, its artillery is firing relentlessly. We're told to follow a wooded footpath to an undisclosed location. Cannons fire nearby, and we hear the whistle of incoming fire. Soldiers can spend months here. I receive the coordinates of the target. They are calculated here at our command post and transferred to our gun, the sight and end goal. I enter them, pass them to the crew to take aim, and then we open fire on command. Artillery howitzers are on constant standby and well hidden as drones hover above the tree cover. I was drafted in January and in April we started training on this vehicle, a 2S1 artillery cannon. Then we came here. We've been fighting the Russians in this type of position for two months now and it seems to be going well. When they're called, they'll fire within 90 seconds. The target is Bakhmut. Along a 1,000 kilometre front line, this is one of many battles. Yolo Abdavid, CGTN, near Bakhmut, Ukraine. At least eight people, including two tourists, have died after rainstorms brought flooding and destruction to parts of Greece, Turkey and Bulgaria. Five people are reported missing in Greece, while thousands of tourists are stranded at airports. Our correspondent Catherine Drew reports. Stay indoors, a warning sent to residents in central Greece and in several islands as the country deals with the latest extreme weather event, severe flooding from the aftermath of Storm Daniel. The resort island of Skiathos saw record rainfall, turning streets into rivers and stranding tourists at the airport as flights were grounded. In the central city of Volos, where a local farmer died trying to reach his animals and five people remain missing, locals were stunned by the extreme conditions. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this before. We know that there is a lot of rainfall, but this is unprecedented. It has never happened before. The damage was caused by the river, the torrent. There was huge flooding. The river overflowed and the water reached us here. I came for coffee in the morning and the whole place was flooded. It drove me crazy trying to leave with the car. Earlier, Greek meteorologists had warned the country should brace for unusually high rainfall. I think everyone realizes there are certain weather phenomena that are beyond the capacity of humans to deal with, no matter how many flood prevention works there are. When an unprecedented volume of water falls, this happens everywhere in the world, we will unfortunately have flooding. In Turkey, a two tourists were swept to their deaths by flash flooding at a campsite in Kirklareli province, near the border with Bulgaria. 
The search for several others missing is ongoing. Istanbul also reported fatalities as heavy rain left homes and businesses flooded. In Bulgaria, a state of emergency was declared as torrential rain saw cars floating in the Black Sea town of Sarivo, where two people were killed. The deadly flooding comes just weeks after a summer that saw record temperatures and intense wildfires affecting all three countries and causing at least 20 deaths in Greece, which saw widespread destruction of forest and farmland. Greek authorities say the storms are expected to ease from Thursday as rescue and cleanup operations get underway. Catherine Drew, CGTN. At least 27 people have died in southern Brazil, where a cyclone has caused severe flooding. The governor of Rio Grande do Sul says it's the state's worst ever weather disaster. Thousands of people have been forced to leave their homes, and some residents have to be rescued from rooftops. Brazil's president, Lula da Silva, has pledged government support. Tens of thousands of people in China's Fujian province have been forced to leave their homes because of flooding. The remnants of Typhoon Haiku has brought intense rain to the region. Power has been cut in some areas and floodwaters have inundated more than 4,000 hectares of farmland. The rain is expected to continue until Friday. The Northern Hemisphere has sweltered through its hottest summer ever. That's according to the World Meteorological Organization. August was about one and a half degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial averages, which is the warming threshold that the world is trying not to pass. Climate scientists say last month was not only the hottest August on record, it's also the second hottest month ever measured behind July this year. It's the final day of a landmark climate summit in Africa, where leaders are discussing ways to fund the continent's response to climate change. Our correspondent, Wilkista Niawaba, is in Nairobi. Good to see you. Now, what have we heard um, from leaders taking part so far today? Well, after three days of deliberation today, we did see the leaders who are assembled here today signing what they call the Nairobi Declaration. And this is basically a document that basically brings together the issues that African countries, African leaders and a number of other stakeholders have discussed and identified as the problems that the, uh, the region, that the continent continues to face, as well as possible solutions. We do know that they they did speak extensively on the fact that funding mitigation efforts uh, had been a huge problem and today they did reiterate that even as they read out the declaration saying that they were urging uh, wealthier nations and developed nations that had pledged money to really uh, to be able to deliver the $100 billion uh, annual amount in order to mitigate uh, climate change efforts and to enable African countries to move forward. So this has been really the highlight of the summit that African countries have been able to come together uh, and agree on what the way forward looks like and that they will now be trying to uh, move everything forward now that they have decided on what needs to be done. Well, Kista Niawaba in Nairobi, thank you very much. And Nasani Mashiri is a senior analyst in climate, environment and conflict at the International Crisis Group. Good to see you, Nasani. Now, look, it's been the hottest summer on record. It, do you think that's made a difference, do you think, at this summit in terms of a sense of urgency on, on climate action? Um, I think in terms of the impacts of these climate shocks on, on Africa, Africa is really bearing the brunt while uh, being responsible for a tiny fraction of global carbon emissions, I think about 4%. Uh, so the way that it impacts African countries is through an increasing uh, likelihood of severe droughts and floods. Where I am in Nairobi, in the Horn of Africa, uh, the region has suffered about three years of failed rains. And now we're facing an El Nino season, which means increasing flooding. Um, and this, of course, is exposing uh, people, uh, particularly communities that I've spoken to uh, in rural areas, people who are farming, people who are herders. It's exposing them to the worst of the climate shocks. Um, so that's really made uh, things very important here. But what we 
really came out of the summit um, was more of a focus on global carbon taxes on fossil fuels. So the messages that came out were really from, from African leaders uh, talking not only, as your correspondent mentioned there, about wealthier countries paying their fair share uh, in terms of mitigation money to Africa, but what they were also asking for was this global carbon tax on fossil fuels, aviation, maritime transportation, and a ref reform of the world financial system um, that ba is basically forcing African countries to borrow more money uh, to basically fund uh, trying to deal with all these climatic impacts. So it's interesting that you, you, you talk about the carbon taxes um, and coming together and deciding on those. Who pays and how much is, is always a hot topic of forums like this. But as well as that loss and damage, there does seem to be a focus on the economic opportunities of, of the green transition, like, as you mentioned, building new financial structures, tapping into Africa's huge mineral wealth. T tell us more about that. Sure. So Kenya's president, William Ruto, right from the start of this summit, uh, said that this wasn't a plain game, that African leaders aren't just pleading for help, but they're offering solutions too for fighting climate change. I mean, it was, it was interesting that the president made his way to the event in a, a small electric car, um, a real contrast to the usual government uh, convoys that you see uh, on the streets of Nairobi often. Um, and what, what they're trying to do is basically provide this new vision, this green vision uh, of investments uh, to basically, as you said, investing in uh, you know, green minerals, for example, but also uh, investing in uh, a change away from fossil fuels, so renewable energies. But you still have to look at the fact that many countries in Africa, particularly just looking around Kenya, look at Sudan, uh, look at Somalia and look by the West, to Niger, look at Gabon. A lot of these countries are suffering from conflict and from political instability. So a lot of these funds are risk of us. So they're not going to invest money in countries that are suffering from, from conflict or political instability. And, and very little was said at this summit about that, exactly what you said. Who is going to pay? How is the money going to come in? Is it just going to go to, to areas which are safer bets for international investment? If this country is uh, this country in Kenya and the continent is really heavily burdened with debt already, it doesn't need more loans. It needs more, more concessional loans, more grants, mm -hmm. um, and that's the only way forward really to make this work. Nazanin Mushiri, thank you very much. A Chinese company is helping to rebuild Montenegro's only coal power plant, bringing in technology to reduce the most harmful emissions. Our correspondent Alyosha Malenkovic is in the town of Pleliva as part of CGTN Europe's special series, Construct, Connect, Collaborate, which marks the 10-year anniversary of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Coal. For some, an environmental killer. For others, a source of electricity and heating. Montenegro faces that same coal dilemma as many countries around the world. This coal-burning electric power plant is essential for Montenegro's energy stability. During the dry summer months, it provides up to 95% of the country's entire electricity needs. But regardless, some here have asked for this plant to be closed, citing environmental concerns. However, Local environmentalists are against shutting down this power plant. They are saying almost 1,500 jobs in the Pjevja coal mine and the power plant are a lifeline for the community. And they claim the power plant is not the sole perpetrator of the air pollution. We started an initiative for a full ban on coal ownership and use for households and public institutions like schools and hospitals. Coal should be used for energy production only and nothing else. A 40-year-old Soviet technology inside this power plant emits solid particles called PM2.5 and PM10. Those are among the top air polluters in Pjevja. 
The air quality during the winter months, meaning from October to the beginning of May, is very poor. Almost every day there are concentrations above the limits of PM10 and PM2.5 particles. There are also times when sulfur dioxide concentrations exceed the limits. Using Chinese technology, the eco-reconstruction involves treating the exhaust fumes to remove the PM particles, sulfur and nitrous oxides from emissions. When finished, it should dramatically change air quality in Pjevja. The thermal power plant at Pjevja will be one of the most modern thermal energy installations in the region. And what is important is that we will receive clean air. And the indirect benefit of the eco-reconstruction is the introduction of the central heating system, which will abolish the need for households to use coal for heating. The residual ash will be used in the cement industry, further increasing the eco-friendliness of this plant. The new system is expected to become operational in 2025, not only saving 1,500 jobs, but also gifting the community fresher air. Alyosha Milenkovic, CGTN, Plevia. And stay tuned as tomorrow we'll continue our special series, Construct, Connect, Collaborate. We'll take you to Spain to check out the longest train trade link in the world from the Chinese city of Yiwu direct to Madrid. You're watching CGTN, still ahead. Avoiding a new Cold War, China's premier tells neighboring countries not to resort to block confrontation. We're at the ASEAN summit in Jakarta next. We're going on a journey round some of the most spectacular parts of Europe to witness how two ancient cultures are collaborating to create a new clean green energy system and hear how working together on green energy could help build trust between China and Europe. If we keep our relationships strong, if we have strong exchanges, China's role will be key and very important for European Union energy transition. Welcome back. A reminder of our headlines. Antony Blinken says the US will continue to give Ukraine what it needs to fight back against Russia as he makes a surprise visit to Kyiv. From wildfires to floodwaters, at least eight people killed in Europe as rainstorms ravage Greece, Turkey and Bulgaria. While scientists report the Northern Hemisphere's hottest summer on record, and African leaders call for new global taxes to fund climate action. China's Premier Li Chang says that major powers must oppose confrontation and a new Cold War. Li was addressing a summit in Jakarta which involved leaders of ASEAN member states as well as Japan and South Korea. Indonesia is hosting a string of annual summits gathering ASEAN and partner countries. Our correspondent Rob Berlin Perber is in Jakarta. Uh, Rob Berlin, what, what else has the Chinese Premier been saying? No, the Chinese Premier Li has also uh, mentioned that sincerity is key uh, to nurture relations between uh, ASEAN and China, and this ties in to the ongoing stable relations, particularly in trade, as we know, at 970 billion U.S. dollars last year between ASEAN and China. Uh, mind you, this is when the pandemic was still ongoing last year. Now imagine uh, the numbers increasing post-pandemic this year. Now this is what uh, Mr. Li Chiang uh, said uh, about close relations between ASEAN and China. China and ASEAN countries have enjoyed geographical proximity and a close affinity. We have adhered to the five principles of peaceful coexistence and the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia. We seek common ground while setting aside the differences and we properly handle disagreements through dialogue and consultation. We consistently deepen practical cooperation in both traditional and non-traditional security fields. We have preserved peace and tranquility in East Asia in a world fraught with turbulences and changes. 
In particular, we've overcome the challenges brought by the COVID-19 pandemic with each other's aid through difficult times. And relations remain strong uh, between the two entities and we'll see further cooperations uh, in trade, security and also tackling on climate change as well, especially uh, post-pandemic as things are easing up. You mentioned climate change. I'm wondering what some of the other issues are that are being discussed at the summit today. Outside of climate change, there's also definitely, as Chinese Premier uh, Li Chang mentioned, to, to, to warn uh, against, to avoid, excuse me, to avoid a, a new Cold War, especially when it comes, when you talk about Myanmar, the crisis, um, the conflicts between, between uh, going on in this region, uh, as Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, Ms. Reza Masuri, have said Indonesia uh, has more than 145 engagements within, uh, with 70 stakeholders in nine months. Now, the five-point consensus is still ongoing, uh, although we know that the military junta is still uh, showing no interest uh, to, to sort of take part in this. Uh, as we look forward to tomorrow on, on Thursday, we see the, uh, on the East Asia Summit, we'll have more updates on you with China and uh, uh, other uh, partners. Rob Berlin, Purba in Jakarta, thank you very much. Russia's Wagner mercenary group is said to be declared a terrorist organization by the UK government. The ban will make it illegal to be a member of the group or to provide it with support. The British Home Secretary called Wagner a military tool of Vladimir Putin's Russia overseas. The Kremlin responded by saying the group did not exist as a legal entity. Three people have been rescued off the coast of Australia after their inflatable yacht was attacked by sharks. The passengers were on a round-the-world voyage when the attack happened as they were headed for Cairns, which is in the northeast of the country. And parts of their vessel were torn apart by the sharks. Rescue crews said the three men were unharmed. A former leader of the US far-right Proud Boys group has been jailed for 22 years for planning the attack on the US Capitol in 2021. Enrique Tarrio's sentence is the biggest handed out so far after he and several other members of the group were convicted of seditious conspiracy. Before the sentencing, he apologised for his actions and pleaded for leniency. The headlines again. Antony Blinken says the US will continue to give Ukraine what it needs to fight back against Russia as he makes a surprise visit to Kyiv. From wildfires to floodwaters, at least eight people are killed in Europe as rainstorms ravage Greece, Turkey and Bulgaria. While scientists report the Northern Hemisphere's hottest summer on record, and African leaders call for new global taxes to fund climate change. Plus, China's Premier Li Chang tells Southeast Asian nations not to take sides in conflicts in order to avoid a new Cold War. And that's the world today. Thanks for watching. There's more news on TG10 Europe's channel on the Telegram app, or you can scan that QR code coming up on the screen to get stories and updates sent direct to your phone. We're back with more news at the top of the hour. Coming up next, though, it's World Insight with Chen Wei. For now, from all the team here in London, goodbye.